Welcome to the Great Bay's Tennis Podcast, episode 93. I'm Steve Smith along with Roberto Calla. And tonight we're going to do another segment on practice. But I have to say this, Roberto, I know that uh, hockey is your new favorite sport. I agree, Steve. <laughs> uh, when I think of 93, I think of Dougie Gilmore. That's an assignment from, for junior tennis players that are looking to be tougher. So Dougie Gilmore was asked on Hockey Night in Canada, how would you become so competitive? And he told a story that I'll tell, so it's obviously secondhand. He said, well, my father used to play football in the side yard, and one of the end zones was the street. And the ball was thrown at me in the street. And, I did, and Dougie's going, I didn't catch it. And so his father yells out, why didn't you catch it? Young Dougie Gilmore goes, a car was coming. And the father said, so? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I got one other thing we have to say. Brandon Flanagan, he's downstairs. We're at the FM Tennis Performance Center, Boynton Beach, Florida. And he's very busy. But he did say, uh, after he did an imitation of you playing soccer. Yeah, playing soccer. He, said he, he was telling uh, one of his coworkers, that uh, he was such a phenomenal mm -hmm. soccer player. And he said out of the blue that you shouldn't have cut your hair. You know, a few weeks ago, <laughs> Roberto had some long flowing hair. He got back from Peru where there's no barbers. And uh, I've been asking some of the moms, and, and one mom I thought was great, she said, yeah, he shouldn't have cut his hair. He looked like, just like a soccer player. <laughs> and I go, oh, that's gonna crush him. But I tease Roberto and go, it's, it's much better to, uh, I mean, like, Roberto, aren't you really depressed that you're, you turn gray instead of going bald. I mean, every, everyone uh, laughed at that one joke. It's probably the only joke I could laugh at. But I stay away from hair jokes. So, Roberto, let's go with another segment on practice. Routines. Um, do soccer players do routines? Uh, no in my days. Just no routines. Um, the only routine is uh, just go and play. Yeah. And play, play, and play. Yeah. Uh, uh, if it's possible, 24 hours. Yeah. With, um, yeah, I do think you can drill and drill and drill. But with, I think, Wayne Gretzky, you know, the Cones. His father watched the Russians in 72, and, he, you know, they get a rink in the backyard and gets the pylons and in and out of the pylons. But you didn't do that where you're dribbling soccer balls in and out of the pylons? Yeah, uh, a little bit. But uh, in those days, um, it's, uh, it's, it's in the news, you know, that uh, my famous coach in Spain, Pepe Guardiola, um, one of the famous uh, uh, soccer players left that team. And when he was interviewed, he said that, um, Pepe Guardiola's practice looks like an uh, um, elementary school. Um, and, and he's one of the more recognized soccer players, soccer coaches, you know? And, um, and his team is Messi, uh, in, uh, Iniesta, Xavi, at that time, all famous. And they train like element, elementary school. What do you mean by elementary school? Just, just go out and play. No, no, no. Uh, they do the basic thing. Basic drills. Basic drills. Yeah. No, I think when you look at any sport, um, pretty much in the warm up, they're doing the same type of drills they did when they were, when they yeah. were young kids. Yeah. With um, Greg Patton, I understand he's coaching now high school tennis as a volunteer. Uh, Steve Campbell told me that who married uh, his sister Colleen that Greg Patton would have coaching Division I tennis players. He pretty much put Boise State on the map years and years ago, that he'd have college tennis players do around the world, and he could pull it off. You know, you just have kids, they hit one ball, and they run to the other side, and if they miss, they're out, and you can start the drill with, you know, 20, 40 kids on the court. But when we have people visit, and we do video work, and we pre do a pre and post before they leave, and we have the line that, the operation was a success, but the patient died. Because many times, you know, the kid will go home, 
and they, they, you know, we get them looking like a million dollars. That does, it's very artificial. It's like, okay, we're dropping a ball. We're doing things in slow motion. They're not actually playing tennis, but we get, we um, go through all these routines. It's very easy for me. And, and I typically do this where I have a player go home. Maybe sometimes it's two kids from the same family and get the parents on the phone, have so-called conference call and go, I can ask 50 questions. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom or pessimistic, but they say no to all these things that we told them to do. Um, you know, for us, a routine, and we start listing them off, it seems like there's not enough hours in the day, but, you know, when you get up, make your bed. You know, the famous speech now that's a book, the Admiral from the Navy, the commencement speech, first thing you do is make your bed. And sense of accomplishment. And I learned this from someone who... Um, had a New York minute in the NFL. But that means they're a great, ten- a great football player. You know, a player who played at Auburn and I was coaching uh, his kids. And um, when you get up in the morning, 50 push-ups and 50 sit-ups before you go to the bathroom. You know, and we get to the point where we're telling kids, you know, 10, 10, and 10, 5, 5, and 5, do five push-ups, five squat thrusts. Um, push-ups, sit up squat thrusts. You know, just that sense of accomplishment, just do it. You know, I mean, even like, you know, first thing you do in the morning, um, I tell kids that, um, you know, while you're taking a long shower, why don't, you, why don't you take a bottle of water in the shower and drink, eight, you know, drink eight ounces, 12 ounces of water while you're in the shower first thing in the morning. And um, it's like, okay, that might be a little bit wasteful when you think about paying the, the electric bill, but there's routine after routine. And, you know, you think about someone like a Kobe Bryant, but I, I, I think this about soccer, ice hockey, basketball, many team sports, is it can be much more spontaneous than tennis. Yeah. You know, tennis, you don't just naturally pick the racket up. Braden was always saying that, you know, don't use the word natural. You just naturally be able to hit the backhand ball. You be, you know, and naturally be able to hit the serve. Um, that's the Ben Hogan line, too. If you do... Um, What's unnatural for 10 years, you'll be a great golfer. And the same, I think the same thing applies to tennis. If you do it's unnatural for, for 10 years. Um, but with us routines, the, the list just continues. Uh, a skip rope routine, uh, you know, and that's where you ask the parents 50 questions. You know, do you have a practice journal, practice log? And, um, you know, I do think that Years ago, the sport in America was baseball. And a kid who just wanted to play baseball was there's nobody around to play with. I mean, you would take, take the glove and you just throw the ball into the glove, you know, hanging on to the baseball. And next thing you know is kids would throw the ball up on the top of the garage and it would roll down and they just catch it and they just throw it softly so it won't go over the garage. But then it's a, it's a solo drill. Um, you know, there's a difference between being lonely and being alone. You know, even an extrovert, who, but if they really have the passion for their sport, they can practice on their own. With, with yeah. soccer, um, I know tomorrow, I guess in, uh, it's the next day, we'll be at the track or at the university. And uh, there's usually somebody out there doing soccer drills by themselves, and then next thing you know is you're playing catch with a soccer ball. Yeah, um, you know, it's... Um like in tennis, we always say, let your racket talk, you know. Um, when uh, I see a soccer player, um, uh, even by the walk, how you walk immediately, it's a communication. So I get over there, I don't have to say any word. We look at each other, okay. And we started passing the ball. Um, and uh, we have a, a good practice, you see. And right away, you know they're level. As soon as they yeah. t- touch, as soon as they touch the ball, you know as they're soon level. Touch it, yeah. With um, Carla Navarro, Wojciech was just here, and I was speaking to her before the podcast started. And we're talking about because she works at the Delray Beach Tennis Center, where they, I think, collectively they have forty-five courts, and the UTR matches or the tournaments are too expensive. We need to oh. find we need to find a way to just create match play. Yes. Yeah. You know. Um, with the UTR, and now it is self-rating. You can play a match and call it in, to my knowledge, but no one's really doing that. 
it should have started that way from the get-go. And I know Dave Fish was really pushing for that. That um, if someone were sandbag it like they do in golf, someone is a, you know, 36 handicap. I think that's as high as it goes. And they're telling people, I am a scratch golfer. Same thing. You just have to watch them hit one ball. But if someone were to sandbag it as a tennis player and go, yeah, you know, I'm an 11.5. And then you watch them just hit for a second. You just know. You just know. But like say in, in ice hockey, um, the basics in ice hockey are, can you stop? <laughs> can you, can you stop? Um, yeah. I remember Herbie Hammond, a hockey coach, he had a shop where he used the hockey college, hockey coach, but he, he had a sports store. He sold hockey equipment. And one of the guys, uh, from, you know, New York city at a state school in New York, he bought a pair of skates and, and he said, uh, I'm going to go out next year, but I got, I've got to learn how to stop. The roughest hockey in the world is college intramural hockey where no one can skate. You know, they're out there waving their sticks. and with. Um, but can you, like, can you cross over going forward to the left? Can you cross over going forward to the right? Can you do it backwards? Those are the skills because if you can't skate, you can't play. And the thing about tennis, I, my you know, thought is that if you can't hit the ball, you can't play. I mean, you've got you've got to be able to rally. Bannerman used to say that once you get a kid to be able to rally, you, you got them hooked. Um, but the routines is getting people to do the routines, and uh, before they leave the house, before they go to school, I mean, it's like brushing your teeth, and um, they have to under understand the importance of it. You know, to the parents. You know, kids fly here once, they fly here twice, and third time you go. Have you put mirrors up in your garage? Uh, no. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. You know, you need to do a shadow swing routine in front of the mirror twice a day. You know, you, you can't be too cool for school. Um, the, uh, the book, uh, I think it's Susie Welch. It's not a sports book, but it's a great title. 10 minutes, 10 months, 10 years. You know, they say if you do something for 10 minutes, for 10 years, you become an expert. I don't know if that's true. I mean, you're, well, you're going to play the piano for 10 minutes and become an ex expert. But I think you would uh, benefit so much from a tennis standpoint if you could say, okay, I'm going to take 10 minutes a day, five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, and do routines. You know, and we have a, a boatload of technical routines. Um, so we just had a, a group of kids, and we're going, okay, are you doing this? They're visiting. We train, we train them uh, for, a, I think maybe six months and they're, they've really improved. You know, one went from a 14 minute mile to a sub six minute mile, you know, 14 minutes. I mean, that's a huge progress. Yeah. That's, you know, people walk faster than that, but, um, and they're great kids, but they're not doing the routines. You know, like, do you have a, the sock in the bag the put the tennis, the baseball weighs six ounces, approximately six ounces, three tennis balls it is six ounces. You put them in a tube sock, a long sock. And once your palm goes up, the energy goes down. So the balls come back and hit you in the head, hit in the back. And you know, that's a routine. Um, we showed you how to throw a racket, one of the best drills you could ever do for your serve. Just need one old racket from a garage sale. Do you go to the backyard, throw the racket, and then run a series of sprints? And th those are routines too. The, but that gets away from the tennis technical routines. But the, the physical routines, um, I say, say the area I know least about tennis is the physical. I mean, I think I can, you know, raise my voice or blow the whistle and get people to do physical exercises. But are they sport specific? Are they appropriate? And um, uh, will they will they do the exercises on their own? So, you know, you just get a group, get a kid, lay on, sit, lay on the floor and just lift your legs. Keep your mm -hmm. legs together, six inches off the ground. It's, it's so interesting how people can do much more if you make everybody watch them. Oh, I, th yeah. I think coaches should film. Uh, that's what TLA team manager, okay, we're going to film, um, you know, don't let the players know it, but you're filming people do push-ups. You're filming people pick up balls. You know, you, that's that's where you you know you tell you can tell who the hard workers are. Okay, we're filming ball pickup, and you know how many people are okay. I'm picking balls up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
yeah, um, I would say the uh, the kids practice uh, differently when you're walking on the courts, and they play differently when you are watching as well. You know, you notice that. I'm told that all the time. Um, <laughs> with I think it's a very good exercise to film practice secretly. Um, you know, this program I ran at a two-year college in Texas, we did it once a year. And the people should have known because everybody talked about it. So what we did is we set up a lab, um, and it went for more than one day. Uh, we, we did scale it down, but at one point it was for five days. And we filmed on the top of these buildings, and we filmed what the players were doing. It was just, it was just comical. Um, yeah, that, you know, the, the self-motivation, self-drive. You know, I like the word uh, Jody Johnson, who we did a lot of work with over the years. He had a, you remember Jody from Tampa, we were there 15 years. He, yeah. He had a gym. It was a Rocky Balboa gym. And he uses the word ignition. He said, that kid's got no ignition. You know, in other words, there's no key to turn turn the motor. Um, with, uh, yeah, the, the, the word uh, affluenza. I think Macro, John Macro gets credit for that, but my my bro- oldest brother used to say, it's hard to have rich parents and poor kids. The parents need to be aware, really aware of that. And, you know, it's, you know, kid, I think so many kids act like there's a money tree in the backyard. And the, um, but no, um, yeah, and they need to have that, re- you know, you need to be relaxed and intense at the same time. Jim Lair is always saying that. It's a pretty tough combo. Um, but I think kids... You know, anxiety in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. I'm getting way out of my my uh, line of expertise, if I have any expertise. But it's proven that you start, when you start making decisions in the back of the brain, you lose coordination, and you just yeah. get, you just see kids so stressed out. And the you know one of the best things I ever heard that certainly gets away from random practice is conscientious neglect. Tell tennis parents be the furthest from the fence. And, you know, you want to have people get to the point where, you know, they don't even know who your kid is. You know, I mean, I used to do that with practice with my two sons is that it, people would come to visit and, you know, that they weren't, no one were to know um, that I was the father. You know, then that's where, um, where Scotty Perelman told me that was a mistake. That was a mistake because my kids called me Steve. And my kids called me Roberto. Yeah. Roberto. Yeah, <laughs> with, uh, but yeah. on practice, um, the the routines, um, Kobe Bryant, you know, little kids learn basketball. Don't lower the hoop. Don't change the size of the ball. Just have them stand right under the hoop, and it might take them a couple months. They start making some shots consistently, and then the next thing you do is have them just take one step back and do it over and over again. And, I mean... If you don't start young, I mean, you really have to have a very, very healthy work ethic. If you don't start young, it doesn't mean that you have to start young in the specific sport. I mean, it's a bonus if you do. It's it's not a bonus if that's the only sport you do. But, you know, a lot of times, I mean, kid comes to see us and, um, you know, we get him to hit the ball really well. And people go, that, that kid is hitting the ball so clean. I go, yeah, but there's no miles on the legs. Go, what do you mean? There's no miles on the legs. Yeah. You know, the kids, um, you know, they never rode a bike. They never they never ran. They never played. And that's something that's, you know, gone away is in this country is pick up sports. They, the soccer specialists in this country say American kids won't play pick up soccer. Where places I've been, soccer games are just instant. Play with, you don't even need a ball. They'll, they'll, they'll come up with something, roll up two balls of socks or... Um, but go ahead. What do you got? Um, we're talking about uh, routines and practice, um, like in the surf, you know, uh, throwing rackets, the sock, throwing a football. Um, comes to my mind and uh, for to our listeners in South America, we have the reputation that we don't have good servers. You know, um, our best uh players in South America. I'll, I'll mention a few of them. I think one of my favorite players is David Nalbandian. No serve. You know. Um, Coria, no serve. 
Um, Luis Orna, no serve. Um, Pablo Araya, no serve. And I can keep going and going. In other words, their serve is a, a point starter, not a point ender. No, no, yeah, no, no free they, points they, off of it. Yeah, they made it, and uh, but without serve. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the points we recognize is that we don't have those routines. We don't, uh, and we said, oh, the Americans, yeah, they have, uh, they serve better because they play baseball, they play football. And uh, will help a lot, our listeners, if they have their routines, uh, have more throwing motion exercises, you know. Um, the other point is, oh, we play in clay and, uh, uh, you know, that's a matter of we're just trying to put the, the serving and we, we're going to fight. We're going we, 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 to uh, have a long point, you know. Um, I think um, now we recognize that uh, really we need to uh, uh, get more information. Uh, some coaches that were, are critical uh, um, by themselves, they say, we, we don't have enough information as well because uh, we produce too many players for the years, but no one with a decent serve. You know? yeah. on, on the serve, uh, Dave Eddy, um, in his own right, very, very good tennis player, uh, tells so many Dave Eddy stories. I remember visiting him where uh, at Turnberry Isle where Fred Stolle was teaching tennis. And... Uh, I told Fred Stolle, or Dave Eddy told Fred Stolle, this is Steve, and, you know, he spent a lot of time with Dennis Vandermeer and Vic Braden, and Fred Stolle said, uh, typical Aussie, he said, uh, we're having a beer with the legendary Fred Stolle. He said, uh, send me your resume, I'll put it in file 13, meaning that, you know, he's going to throw it away. Um, Dave, Dave Eddy used to tell a story about Torben Ulrich, the great Dane, who, I mean, when he was... Uh, 48, he looked, his legs looked like they were 18. And he played Davis Cup for Denmark forever, and this is in Europe, and at the French Open, and and David, he just hears one ball hit. And yeah. he goes, and he, some time goes by, and he hears one ball hit. And there's just enough light on the court where Torben Oliver could hit a serve, go to the other side, and hit a serve. He was basically hitting a serve in, in total darkness. Um, Stan Smith has a 72 serves. Now, this is obviously a routine on court. So he has three locations for singles, three locations on the baseline. He has four serves. I should say three serves. Slice, flat, and top. And he has four targets. So you multiply the three places and the three spin serves, and then you get nine, and then you get four targets, you get 36. You get deuce court, add court, you get 72. You know, one thing, you know, Brandon, part, Brandon Flanagan, his partner, they have an amazing setup here. But one of the best things about it is it's really a stone's throw, maybe a half dozen golf shots from 16 backboards all over Florida. Um, there's these three wall racquetball courts. You know, you can go serve, and if you're serving well, you get the toss out to the right, the ball just comes right back to you. Yeah. You just serve one place, serve, catch, serve, catch. And, you know, that's coming back to basic routines. And what we, the body of work we've put together, ideally the great base, you know, is for little kids. No substitute for good beginning. Andy Fitzell is always saying, well, when you say that, be careful because you're pigeonholing yourself. You know, it's because it's, it, it works for all levels of play. I mean, it's just solid fundamentals. Yeah. Um, but how many kids actually go out and say, okay, I'm going to practice, you know, hitting the uh, off pace slicer in the deuce court? I would say so many old kids, not just young kids, say right-handers because of their mechanics collapsing, bending at the waist, body to leader. They're hitting second serves out wide all the time to the right, to their opponent's forehand. Karlovic, I've been told that Karlovic, uh, you know, he might practice his serve for an hour and just hit 12 to 15 serves, just really taking his time. Um, I do, I, I do think when uh, Peter Burrow, I should always say that, is you got to practice with a purpose. So when kids are hitting serves and they're just talking to the person next to them, the brain's not switched on and they're not growing myelin at a fast rate. Um, you know, I think one way to measure the serve is um, 
the depth of the serve and the speed of the serve. Trajectory certainly has something to do with it because the trajectory is what determines what makes a ball bounce high. Is people with an old tennis ball, if they hit a serve and it's going three or four feet up the fence on one bounce, okay, they're doing something right. I remember a uh, tennis player years ago, Greg Harris, and he was a good tennis player. He was a better dancer back during the days of uh, John Travolta and Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Fever, Saturday Night Fever, senior moment. And we were all at the Moody Coliseum watching great, great tennis players. And he goes, these, these guys don't serve any bigger than I do. Look where the ball's going on the back fence. And I started, I, go, I, I said, look where the ball's bouncing. And he goes, yeah, you've had me do that. My serve bounces the same height. I go, yeah, but that stadium court is probably 42 feet behind the baseline <laughs> to the fence, and we're practicing on courts that are regulation or 21. Yeah. Um, I think favorite routines, um, you know, work is something that you don't want to do. You know, and that's where, like in basketball, can we scrimmage coach? Can we scrimmage coach? And the, I think most Division One college basketball coaches, the number is 300. You know, Kobe Bryant was going to make 400 shots on the game floor, you know, at the stadium, and he was going to be on the floor when the opposing team showed up, and he was right in their face going, that's 350, 50 more, and I'll be ready for you guys tonight. You know, just totally in intimidating them through his, through his work ethic. You know, he got along, you know, read about it, he got along great with Shaq. They were like brothers. Yeah. But Shaq was just saying, he was just always on my case because I didn't have his work ethic. <laughs> And, um, but, yeah. um, certainly all work and no play is, a, is a, it makes, you know, it makes, it was a dull boy is that, uh, you get into the brain typing. If you know, you're a J like I'm a J it's like, okay. And I'm an N. So I'm thinking structure and I'm thinking down the road is I'm like, well, how to make it fun for these, uh, 10 year olds. Um, I used the Dennis Vandermeer drill on Saturday some kids are warming up for a tournament. And I said, okay, just play a set of Mr. Nobody. And if you want to be politically correct, you can say misses nobody, miss nobody. Is that you hit a serve, and it's got to be in. If you get your serve in, you're up 15 love. You miss your serve, you're down love 15. And what happens right away is kids will miss the first three, four serves. And you go, you lost the game. And then they go, oh, i got to get the ball in. Yeah, you got to get the ball in. And, you know, and most kids should just hit two-second serves. Just hit two-second serves. And um, with, you know, practice your first serve all day long. But when it comes down to the match, just hit, when you're in your form of years, you hit two second serves. Yeah. Um, Steve Denton, I remember Steve Denton telling uh, Austin Krychek, I was at Kalamazoo with the two of them, and Krychek was in the finals, and he, Denton just told him, you know, so you know, here's a guy who's got to be close to being one in the country. He win Kalamazoo, um, and Denton said, "Don't try to hit one ace. Your serve's not good enough." You know, the thing about hitting spot serves, you don't see kids today um, putting out uh, tennis ball cans. You know, the famous story yeah. about Harry Hopman, uh, the late Peter McNamara was somebody, I think there's only two people who did it, is that they would hit serves and he hit a tennis ball can, and uh, it was $1,000. That's what I've heard. Maybe, maybe I don't think it was just 100 Maybe back then it was $100, $100. But if he hit, he hit two in a row, he'd set the can back up, he hit it again get the thousand um, dollars I've done that where you where you get people to drop hit balls in the basket so you empty all the balls you put the basket on the other side and you you know you just do it for a dollar and you tell people okay drop hit balls it stays in the basket you put the basket right tie tucker right in the, the fat part of the court right in the mm -hmm. middle that where we put the five foot marker the Braden marker five feet from the center of the baseline and Braden asked Billie Jean King one time if you could hit every ball here, how would you do? And she said, after she thought about it for a minute, she would never lose. So yeah, I've, I've done it a few times for $100 and lost. Um, for some nine-year-old kid, just gets it in. And but the, the enthusiasm they have, you know, for, for doing it for money. Yeah. And to ramble, that reminds me of the Bobby Knight story where Bobby Knight goes to a, to a basketball clinic and he has all these kids. He's pretending that he his, his watch is actually a stopwatch, and it's not. And he goes, okay, run down, run back. And he goes, well, the fastest guys, the three fastest guys were this. And he goes, uh, I'll give money to anybody who can do that a little bit faster. 
And then everybody sprints. And that's how he opens his clinics. And he goes, you, you, you phonies, sit down. You guys are such phonies. I had to tell you that, you know, if you run it, I'll give you 10 bucks. And then you guys get all enthusiastic. And, um, you know, with parents, um, just think of all the people I've met over the years. Um, I think a great idea is where you have kids have to do chores around the house. I grew up with a kid who used to go, Mark Hamlin, would go to his house, and it would always slow, always slow us down when we get to his house because there'd be three chores we'd have to do before he could go play. And, um, but the, anyway, to have kids do chores to earn points so they can play tournaments instead of just give, give, give. Yeah. But we'll have to touch upon a few more routines, but what do you got for uh, practice? Uh, before, uh, yeah, um, about practice, um, let, me, let me tell you... Uh, like I said, and in, in South America, we recognize we don't have uh, the information. And w for years and decades, we have players, um, elite players, with no serves. If um, I'm going to try to help them and say that if you will be invited to uh, South America uh, with the purpose and say, all right, we're going to have the new generation, even uh, Diego, you know, uh, uh, Schwarzman, uh, no serve. You know, um, if uh, with your experience, if you were invited to Argentina, Peru, or any country, what would you tell them to improve the new generation, new players coming with that will serve? Well, I think years ago, um, every kid in America could throw a baseball. Um, if you couldn't throw a baseball, they'd say you throw like a girl. And years and years ago, it wasn't fair for girls. You know, they, they thought throwing a ball was a muscular activity, and they threw like they were throwing the shot put. I see. It's, it's interesting. In World War II, the Americans were throwing grenades and being very, very accurate. The Germans were putting the, the grenade on like a six, eight inch, in six to eight-inch rod, and they'd put it behind their back, and they'd go like this, and then every once in a while they'd go, whoops, because the grenade landed behind them. Um, no, you have to throw, you have to be taught how to throw properly. Um, you know, I do think that, um, there's so many stories about kids that played baseball that, you know, became really good servers. St you know, Steve Denton, who we spoke to, um, understand the mechanics of the serve, but then the reps, the reps, um, you know, to say, okay, we're going to play soccer, but now we're going to, you know, we're going to teach you how to play lightning ball, which is really ultimate Frisbee with a tennis ball, so to, to make it fun, but you gotta be able to throw the ball. Um, uh, Cole Reeves, who was a guest on our podcast, uh, he uh, is always thinking and, uh, you know, just actually have people go out and try to uh, serve as far as they can, throw the long ball. You know, you, you, you gotta be careful when you have people throwing a tennis ball. You know, you can only, only have kids play tennis baseball for a short period of time. Yeah. So that type of drill for the South, you know, in South America, um, one player just catches it. They're the human ball machine. They catch it and they throw it. With that's something I, I learned from Braden, where you're much more accurate with your hand. And um, I remember being in Indonesia where they bet on anything, and you know, just and I just threw that out there. I said, why don't you have them play tennis? Uh, bet them. You you play um, without a racket. And unless it's a real high level, you know, that you get two athletes, the player without a racket would win. You just catch it and throw it back. But you can, kids, you know, kids can be careful where they throw their, their arm out. Uh, Jennifer Roberts was with us. She, now as her maiden name, Morgat, she became the coach at the University of Illinois. She was there first, and, you know, Craig Tiley was there following her. And um, what she did on a regular basis is she had the Illinois baseball team come out and just play the girls, play the girls team. And how that started, um, be careful of the names, Lindsay Nemo, um, she married Tal, uh, Tal, D-A-L, should be able to tell you his last name, great guy, and he was the manager. And they weren't, the girls weren't treating him nicely. And I said to him, I, go, I was up there doing a Labor Day camp, you know, it's just, bring me in to set the tone. And, and I just said to him, uh, can you play baseball? He goes, I love baseball. I play in high school. My, my brother's playing uh, minor league baseball. I said, good. 
All you have to do is catch the ball and throw it down the middle. And, you know, in front of all the other players, called out the number one player and said, uh, you're going to lose the manager. I didn't tell him that, you know, you're more accurate with your hand. Yeah. I said, he's just going to catch the ball and throw it back. He's going to kill you. And he did. Um, so, um, you know, you look at someone like Curios. I mean, he's so loose and so far out to the right, so far out in front. Um, I would say that a lot of the, um, not just South Americans, the clay court players, you'll hear the term, they have a clay court serve. Yeah. Because, you know, they're going to beat people with their legs. They're going uh -huh. to, they're going to, that's gonna, the idea. They're, they're going to spin the ball in and they have a, they have a baseline serve. In other words, they toss on top of the baseline. And, you know, that last segment of the kinetic chain, I mean, the elbow, the elbow points so far forward when the arm, when the arm snaps out. Can and you explain a little bit more about the, uh, the mechanics of the serve to uh, listeners to understand? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, we have a lot of content that, that's visual. Um, but you want to stay in contact with the ground until we spoke to Gideon Arrow, where do the forces come from? You can see movement, but you can't see forces. And, I mean, he helped Braden so much, and Braden certainly helped Gideon out, but um, Vic really, really knew tennis, but then to, to pair up with a biomechanist. So, um, you know, first of all, people start serve palm up. They they're just want to get the ball in the box. People making decisions for uh, little kids playing tennis haven't taught tennis. It's like having a... You know, a kid, he's, he's going to ride a bicycle that's 26 inches high. No, they, they, they don't necessarily need to start on a tricycle or a, a bicycle with wheels. Now they have these balance bikes, and, you know, your feet can touch the ground. But kids are really, they're learning agility. They're learning to steer. They're getting over the fear factor with these balance bikes. But someone said, no, the other bikes were better because the kid would fall down, get up, fall down, get up. They say the most difficult thing you do in your life from a physical standpoint, as far as pain is to be born. But no one teaches a kid how to walk. They just fall down, get up, fall down, get up. And, and you know, no one's giving them lessons, and it's like they do it on their own. You know, they're pulling themselves up. And, but I think with mechanics, stay in contact with the ground till the last segment of the kinetic chain snaps out. But it can't snap out if the contact isn't in the wrong place. So we do the drill, you know, and it's a routine. Um, so say you mentioned serve routine. So we, we can say, okay, here are the throwing exercises we have. Um, um, Dana Gill was here visiting. Um, and, you know, a guy playing tennis in his 55s, representing the USA, and he's, you know, basically it, uh, has had a lifetime in tennis, you know, running public facilities in Northern Cal. So he was hanging out with us a couple of days, and, you know, he just had... We, have, we use student teaching, so we're going to teach these kids how to throw a ball. And, you know, okay, here's exercise one. Mm -hmm. Just throw the ball. But you have to show them how to throw it. And, you know, just think about kids who can throw a ball, and then they go to some kid who's played some Little League baseball, and they, or they gal can play softball, and they go to a tennis camp, and they're taught down together, up together. You can still see how people are taught. Um, so then, then what you do is you put a ball in your – keep it in your hand with a throwing action – you toss the ball, and you don't release the ball, but you hit the ball with a throwing action. Um, you know, somebody hanging on the end of the racket and just swinging the sock. The centrifugal force takes the ball out to the right, but the toss, when someone has to make an angular change with the swing, the swing slows down. Almost everybody is tossing to their right, either tossing too far to the left and because they just want to get the ball in the box. Really, little kids, when they start a point, it should be you can serve anywhere in the court. You know, they stand right in the center of the baseline and just serve anywhere in the court. This ball's going to be going so slow, you can get it anyway. But at least the leaders of tennis want to have the kids put the ball in the court. contests on um you know who, who can serve the ball the furthest coming back to cole reese and that long ball um you know people are putting the brakes on so a routine for us elvis presley on a skateboard snap down so you take elvis with a skateboard with the with the guitar you have to tell kids who elvis is 
And um, almost everybody, uh, I was telling a little 10-year-old girl today, uh, like this girl, Tasia, who you're helping me with, is get over here. In the deuce court, she's got the wrong stance. I go, you can do that now, but you're going to regret it later. Why don't you just stand the way you're taught? The service dance. False sense of body rotation and supports a toss over your head. But then they get on YouTube. Oh, the pros do it. And it's like, that's not the rationale. Just because the pros do it. But then watch how they reset their foot and they get confused by that. Um, the You know, to have a continental grip. Um, most kids don't have a continental grip. Just grip swing body. You know, they don't have rotation from the ground up. A Vandermeer's drill, the... The, we call it the Vandermeer drill where you, what a genius he was, to have people bring the racket behind their back. You know, Pete Sampras, he's on the baseline. It looks like his racket is going in alignment with the baseline because he's increased the upward angle so much. Um, I think, you know, you do hear like th throwing a ball, but it's more like throwing a ball from center field over second base into home plate. It's not, com it's, it's much closer to that, the serve, than it is the baseball the baseball throw, the baseball pitch. Um, but, you know, practice, 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 but practice the right things. But then do they do the routines? You know, most people save the serve to last. You know, they don't really emphasize, you know. it's. Um, but I do think that it's a baseline mentality. That yeah. They're going to beat people. Um, you know, that's a negative of, of American tennis. You know, here in Florida, we do have tournaments on clay. Around the country, there's all these clay court clubs, but very few places in the country are there clay court tournaments. And um, so there's pros and cons to everything, but I think a clay court mentality is, I'm just going to out-rally the person. Yeah, you're right. Um, and uh, it's uh, changing now. Uh, before was uh, m more emphasis, say, oh, oh, I'm a clay court player. And... Uh, but now you have to play in any uh, surface, you know, um, hard, uh, grass. And um, so it's more concerned now um, about how we can develop players with uh, a better serve, you know. And yeah, no, I, I actually, Raven Klaassen's father was here playing seniors. And, um, you know, Raven, you know, he's getting a little bit older. He's going to be 40. And... Um, you know, how fast is the serve? And really, you know, a lot of times the term is you just get somebody who can really serve and you just clean up at the net. Um, you know, that gets into another topic where they do it in pro baseball where they're in college, they're using the aluminum bat or the graphite bat, I'm not sure. But in pro baseball, you use a wooden bat. I mean, I think that they should, you know, the powers of B, and the, the real power brokers of tennis are the players, and the players are going to say no. Um, if you took, you know, say, well, if we had a tournament with wooden rackets, who would do well? Djokovic would do well because of the mechanics. Oh, yeah. Federer would do well, you know. Um, with, um, you know, it's great to have kids play with an old wooden racket. Pete Sampras, um, he was asked if his son, I believe his oldest son, his son Christian, if he were to play tennis, what would you recommend? You know, start with a wooden racket. Um, the... Um, yeah, the serve plus one where kids, you know, get your serve in. And I just, that just, I hear that way too many times. So, but people are told, arch your back, toss over your head. And young kids get really mesmerized by being able to kick surf. You know, so many things, uh, if you're repeating myself for these podcasts, but I taught tennis with Rick Schroeder, his father, Ted, won Wimbledon. And some hotshot juniors tossing way over his head, doing the limbo. And um, the thrasher, Ted Schroeder, he got down on one knee and hit an overhead on the return serve. And he said, hey, kid, you can't serve that way up here. Um, with uh, No, so to have the emphasis be, you know, they'd say, okay, we're going to play today, but you get three serves. You know, you can tell kids, and you think, okay, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to get the loose arm. I'm going to get out to the right. I'm going to get the lefty out to the left and go for it. Um, think about Ivan Izevich. What a great serve. Yeah. And, you know, he was, you know, lefty, but he's low and out to the left. And he, he helped Selich with his serve. He said, hit it like me. Toss it lower, toss it to the side. 
You know, and Fetter's even even referred to Silich. You mean before he changed his serve or after he changed his serve? Um, you know, to get a few more miles per hour on the serve, um, you know, again, coming back to the question on forces, getting the aerial. Um, it was good to talk to him, especially the, the, the lead-ups to that podcast where that, that comment was for Jimmy. You know, Vic Braden used to tell me when I did his serve, he goes, Steve, you're rubbing your chest against the cement. Um, and it, you're just not going to be able to hit it. Um, with, um, but routines... Can a kid, you know, so many great things happen in a garage. Or you say, okay, well, this business started in a garage. Uh, telling Doug Tomlin, great guy, trained him to teach tennis years ago, a musician, tennis family. He's got three boys who play. And he's got a great chance to have him become pretty good players because the mom wants him to be able to play tennis. And I said, you know, in Delray Beach, right down the street, there's a place called the Art Garage. And uh, we had... Uh, our comedian from uh, Toronto, Will Resnick, baby. And uh, so I went with him, and um, I, was telling, I was telling Doug, he plays like 10 instruments. I said, you and I should go do an act. I said, you know, he's got, a, he's got a lot of great tennis lines, put a little music to it. That guy's a great coach from the knee down. <laughs> from the knee down. <laughs> Meaning that they just teach footwork. I mean, move, move, move. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but let me, you know, you're asking about information. Today I was at a tournament and I used one of your lines. Uh, I steal lines from people, but I give credit. So we're going to interview Chad Burial in an upcoming segment. I use a lot of his lines. He was with me for five years or with us. You were there. But you say no information. That kid's got no information. So I'm sitting down with a young kid. He just won the match. He's going to be playing the finals. And I said, look at that girl serve. And her feet, you know, she's like 15 years old. Her feet are going backwards. She has so many problems with the palm up and the dress palm up and the toss. She looks like she's on a diving board jackknifing, and she, she ends up going two feet back. And I said, okay, now watch this girl. But, and, I, and again, great kids, but, you know, the junior song, I, me, I, me, I, me, we have them sing that song. It's just look around. Yeah. Look around. I mean, who, who here can volley? Who here has a long hitting zone on the forehand? But... Um, you know, what you see a lot of times, and we have to point that out to our players who have been taught to hit the ball clean, is that kid's got no information, and maybe it's a, a, a bonus in some ways that they learn true grit. They've got no strokes, and they're out there, they just learn to fight because they've got nothing. I mean, I watched two boys today. One was the top seed. There's a 16 under tournament. And, you know, well, this is an L, or not, USTA, L, was it a? A, a three, it's a third number. They, they used to have different names, but and the parents said, "This is a big term. This is a three. And I'm going, "Okay, uh, <laughs> it's not a two, but it's, it's a not two a four. Or four. <laughs> and I mean, these poor kids. Not always. I mean, there's always one or two, per se, five years that shock us all. Pepe Merlo, um, Carlos Goffey talks about Pepe Merlo, where when he hit the ball, you couldn't even hear it. He had no speed but he just put the ball right next to the baseline. But most kids playing tennis, you know, I, I mean, I tell a lot of parents, you know, the light at the end of the tunnels is a train coming right at you. you you got to go back to the drawing board. But another way to say that is most kids, you know, they could be 13 years old, and their best tennis is behind them. So if you can film them, here's a routine. We film people. We do a narrated slow motion analysis, and we ask people for notes. Watch the tape three times. First time straight through. Second time, stop and start your tape to take notes. Third time, logical sequential order. You're thinking, grip, swing, body on the serve. Grip, swing, body, toss. Send us notes. What do we tell you to do with your grip? What do we tell you to do with your swing? What do we tell you to do with your body? And they don't send us notes. They don't send us notes because the kids are empowered and entitled. You know, I mean, some kids are really good basketball player. You know, on the freshman, the freshman year, they're playing on the first team, the freshman team. And they don't necessarily make the varsity when they're a sophomore. You know, the old Michael Jordan story got cut, but the coach cut him so he could play JV, get more court time, more game time. And, um, but he was in Jordan's driveway every night. You know, he wasn't thinking about, okay, we're going to make you a high school basketball star. We're going to make you a star. Um, so, the routines you teach people to do it, boredom. Tom Brady, embrace the boredom. 
go to the garage. You know, some kids don't have a garage. They live in an apartment. But find a way. Um, you know, kids, you know, all these transition balls, red, orange, green dot, just to get a foam ball. You won't break anything with a foam ball. And um, in pretty much anywhere you can practice your serve with a foam, foam ball. And, um, you know, you said the story the other day about one of the coaches, one of the players visiting, they are watching some sporting event, and they shadow swing in front of the sporting event. Yeah. Um, George, not Goldoff, but George Silveroff, um, he came to hang out with us one time and uh, played at Texas, so that means he's a very accomplished player. And it was during the NBA playoffs. Unfortunately, we had another TV, so some people could watch the NHL playoffs. But he, he shadow swung the whole game. You know, shadow swung the whole game. I tell kids when they're watching TV, a routine is during the commercial is hit the floor. But now people don't watch TV like that. They watch TV, and they've got another electronic device going. <laughs> you know, they got their laptop, and they're watching, watching the football game. And, um, you know, 30-minute show is 22 minutes. Say, so, okay, you do this for eight minutes. Watch your show. Enjoy your show. Uh, we tell people, do your homework. Student athlete, student is first. Routine is get your English homework done and take five minutes. Don't just go to the refrigerator, open the door, and see if anything's grown in there since the last time you opened it. Is go do some routines. And then, you know, I think really to have, you know, it's on our tape, um, we have a how to practice at home. Um, you, spent, you spent so much time with Victor Liloff. I'll tell you a story about routines with him. Is that, um, but it's on the tape. If you do it, you're a hero. If you don't do it, you don't, you, you don't do it, you're zero. Mark Spann, it was on our podcast. He sent Victor to us, and then not too much longer he came back. But he came back with his sister. She was older, Redina Scholar. And when she came back, she had strokes. She hadn't really played any. She was new to tennis. But they just um, they just went to the content. And uh, it was interesting when Span sent them to me. They went, they went back, and they didn't go back to the tennis club. They went to the basement. You, don't, you know, when, you're, when you want to learn to hit a tennis ball really well, you don't need to go to the tennis court. You know, it's instruction, destruction. You know, that's where it's like, okay, they've shown me what to do. I need to repeat it. It's like the actresses in the movie uh, King Richard. Those two girls did an excellent job mimicking Serena and Venus. But they practiced eight hours a day just studying film and then pre- and just studying their movements. And it was, I thought that was an excellent part of the movie. But yeah, you remember Victor. Victor's sister, uh, you know, he was just eight years old. The, he, um, you know, I told the parents and he wanted to come live with us. They didn't know he's too young, but then they found out this sister was a scholar and her, her time with high school remaining. But before the sun was up, they were up doing routines. And, you know, wish him well. You know, you, um, I read something where he, um, he just won a, Doubles tournament. They didn't have a finals. It was a walkover, but I should be able to tell you Bruno's last name. The guy loves tennis, and they play each other in a 12-year, 12-and-under Orange Bowl. And um, if he, he, if someone is taught the routines, they should do them. It's like Manny Ramirez. He traveled with a T. He was like one of the best baseball players, hitters. And he, when he would go to a, on a road trip, he would take a T with him, and he'd practice his swing. You know, you and I taught for 15 years right next to where the Yankees play, spring baseball. Yeah. And, you know, Derek Jeter is a, the name that comes to my mind. It was the only famous players. But here's Derek Jeter, and they'd call, him a, they'd call the coach a swing coach. And they're right there, and they're, there's no ball. And, um, the, you know, and if there is a ball, it's just sitting on a tee, and they're just shadowing, okay, this is how you have to approach the ball. And, but there's respect. In baseball, it's so hard to hit a baseball. You know, it's, um, you know, that's the thing about pickleball. Um, we had a baseball diamond in our backyard, and our neighbors across the street had a hockey rink. And I was the youngest. I couldn't hit a wiffle ball. And then they came out with this big bat. And then I, I mean, you know, six, seven years old, and I could hit a wiffle ball. But there's a baseball, softball, and wiffle ball. That's what pickleball is. Yeah. I, I was told, I'm encouraging people that play tennis, um, play, play pickleball. Go, go take some money from those, those tournaments. 
I was told that, you know, by the year 2030, it's going to be 50-50. There are a number of tennis players and a number of pickleball players. But one thing I was told, side note, digressing, is that pickleball, just a swing volley. You know, the conventional volley is is, because you can't close in. Yeah. But um, there's a place for the swing volley. Agassi, um, here's a routine. Feed a ball to players that doesn't, but the ball doesn't bounce. If you, you know, you feed the ball with some speed and if they can take that ball out of the air, um, the famous story where uh, Agassi's at a baseball park and they turn the machine on. One of our trainees a long time ago, Steve Young was with Aaron Christine and Agassi, they turn the machine on, the balls come out as fast as possible. Agassi starts running with a baseball bat and hitting ball after ball. The baseball players are just looking at him. So, but he started early. He started early. And, you know, uh, all these things were repeating, perhaps. But Agassi, how he hit the ball so well. I mean, he walked like a penguin. I mean, he was not like a super athlete. <laughs> and a- Agassi, um, you think of Agassi and Davenport, you know, they win the French and they couldn't even slide on clay. But they both hit the ball deep, 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 deep. But Agassi's father, he was a bellman. Agassi's the youngest of four. They were in Chicago. And then he goes to a hotel in Las Vegas. And then he saves some money, and now he can buy a house. He buys the house. He never sees the house. The realtor's going up the front door. Hey, Mike, famous story. They would go around back, and he just measures off the house. Excuse me, measures off the backyard. Just paces it off, left and right, or you know the length and the width. And um, he goes, "I'll take it." Never saw the inside of the house. Bought the house. That means he had a very supportive wife. <laughs> but he was a man on a mission, so he's, he soups up the ball machine, 2,500 minimum per day. So the kid, out of survival and out of fatigue, he learned to have very short, compact swings. I don't think anyone has ever used their legs as well as Agassi. You know, I mean, we just had a young boy uh, and his brother from Montreal, number one in Quebec, and every time he's stepping across on the backhand, his legs are locked. Um, you know, it was at the Battle of Boca this weekend. You were coming to another tournament. And we got a player who doesn't lift. You know, he, he doesn't lift on the backhand side. And, you know, his ball, he's not going to get the, the MPH, the RPMs. He's not, he's not going to get the trajectory. Um, but you do all those routines. Vic Braden, there's no such thing as little strokes for little folks. I mean, there's a few things. Like you could teach someone to hit a two-handed forehand, you know, developmentally. And we have a clip on that where you – Say if you're right-handed, um, you keep the, the right hand on the bottom for the serve, the right hand on the bottom, you teach them a one-handed volley, right hand on the bottom for the two-handed volley, two-handed backhand, underspin backhand. The only time they have to switch is when they hit their two-handed forehand. But people have that backwards. They don't know how to do it overall. They don't, have to, they don't know how to do it developmentally. But um, Dennis Vandermeer, you got to con the little buggers. you got to use trickery. You know, you and I work at this little private school, and they have uh, a nice playground area, and I guess they have this thing they call it the zip, zip slide. You know, I'm always telling, if, you know, we're not working with many young kids, um, but the ones we're working with, okay, you know, if you do this, you can go do that. You know, yeah. go do this slowly, do this properly, and then you can go do that. You can t- have a kid on a tennis court and say, okay, if you can hit, hold, play statue, and then I'm going to give you a crazy feat. You know, and you you know you give it the Dennis Vandermeer feed where you swipe the racket one way or the other and the ball jumps and it goes like a one of those zigzag balls and the kid wants the crazy feed, but no, you got to hit it like a tin soldier um, at first. But but, but anyway, routines, um, on court routines, but we're talking about solo routines in the garage before you leave the house. You know, you do your English homework. It's okay. I'm going to do that, and we do a lot of our students because we are perhaps over-teaching versus I think the, the industry norm is to under-teach. So we, but we're getting people that have to go backwards and deprogram, reprogram. And so there's a major emphasis on technique and they don't like to do the physical exercises. You want to have a kid hit off the cone, put a skip rope behind it and go, okay, do 40 jumps and then hit four balls off the cone on your forehand and do 40 jumps, four off the backhand. And all of a sudden they're taking their time hitting that ball off the cone because they like oxygen. You know, to, um, Coach Ilya Simjohn, we're going to get him on, and uh, he does a great job teaching people to do double hits, and, or du- double jumps, double skip jumps. 
And um, there has to be a routine to teach that. And it's like, how, how do you build? You, you know, you got to baby steps to climb up the mountain. Yeah, um, routines, uh, Steve. Uh, other uh, uh, concern I have is not only in South America, it's uh, all around now. Um, uh, juniors, uh, uh, college, and uh, top players don't know how to volley. You know, uh, what routines will help uh, programs, teachers, uh, coaches, uh, um, these, the students to start to get more familiar at the net, you know? You have to understand building blocks. If you go to our website, course, Tennis Intelligence Applied, it's a disaster, total disaster, having kids play doubles. What's even a bigger disaster is now they're charging so much money, kids aren't even playing doubles. Um, you know, we have people go up and stand against the wall, and if there's a place in your house where you can just trace with a pencil where the racket goes, and a kid stands up, or they go right up to the wall. You do it against the fence, but they turn and they put their racket right against the wall. Okay, okay now do it on the backhand side. And um, granted, a kid is going to be volleying when they're really young with grip on three. It's not continental when they get older. That opens their face 45 degrees. It's a composite grip. No such thing as a perfect grip, grip with the least amount of adjustment. And so you teach these exercises. You know, it's like Braden had the drill where you just put your racket, you can do it with your palm, just put it against the fence, and now you have a swing that doesn't go off the fence. Um, but when you teach, teach doubles, for example, you can have kids hang onto the racket, two hands like it's a steering wheel, and they just are pushing forward, and they have fun with it. The racket face is vertical. It's not a very good drill if the ball is below the level net. Yeah. So you can have a two versus two, but the, you're teaching athleticism on one side. You guys got to catch the ball and toss underhand. You know, you could be three on three, little kids, catch the ball, toss it under your hand, and they're just trying to push it back like this. And then you have to add a score to it and have to add, add, add a prize. It could, it could be um, winning team doesn't pick the balls up. Winning team gets the water break first. Uh, so Dennis Vanry, you got to con him. And um, so then you've taught the athleticism where they can catch a ball and toss underhand. So the first, that's the first thing you do to teach doubles. And, you know, you do it with big kids, and they can have some fun with it. Say, okay, now the team that catches the ball, they have to toss it to the forehand volley only. You toss it to the backhand volley, you lose the point. So recognition, you know, we talked about that in practice, about practice last week. You know, you have to read, excuse me, you have to, yeah, you have to read the situation, plan the situation, do. So read, plan, do. So, um, so the kids have to recognize, okay, toss it to the forehand volley. And then now you, okay, now you toss it to the backhand volley. And um, it's very slow. The ball's, being, the ball's bouncing, they're catching. One of the worst things you can do is have two little kids go to try to rally with the tennis center. They're going to quit because they're not, they're not good enough. So you have to really be clever. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, you're all highly intelligent, but are you clever? And, you know, to figure things out. I like the phrase, uh, recently we've had a parent who says it quite often, I get it, I get it. Because, you know, most of them, they don't get it. You know, they're, they just... They're new to the sport. They haven't been in it around a long time. And, um, they, you know, I say parents, they know so much about so many more things than I do, but they're a newbie to tennis, maybe even a newbie to sport. But coming back to teach people how to volley, um, I've done exhibitions where you get some little kids out and go, okay, they're going to be able to play some doubles. But it's build-up drills. And, you know, you can even do it, okay, now um, you can take – the. You know, and that's what the great base is. It's a body of work. So you take um, the Jim Verdict 10-minute warm-up drill. People can go back and listen. to. Their, we dedicated a podcast or two to Jim Verdict. We had his son on. Um, but, you know, I think, um, trying to blank, um, tennisteacher.com. I'll think of it in a minute. He loves tennis. Oscar Wagner. And I've spent time with Oscar. I remember back in the 70s hanging out with Oscar Wagner and, you know, I lived in my van, and I had a sound system, and we're listening to, you know, lectures from Chet Murphy and Bill Murphy and um, Clarence Mabry and all these tennis teachers from the past, Elaine Mason. So, um, he, you know, he has the, the drill, find the ball, touch the ball. That's for the volley. You find it as your footwork, and then find the ball, brush the ball. 
And many tennis, you can't hit the ball hard. They can, there's no science that, okay, the transition balls are going to help. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it does make people look good. I always t tell, and I like the transition balls in some ways. I make a point, say, okay, we're going to have the 18-year-olds go out there and play with some orange balls. Just so you don't, you know, you just change the culture, change the thinking. Like, no, 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 no. It just slows it down. But, you know, I always tease and go, well, we could play with a balloon. But the, the expression that children, and it's true with beginners too. I mean, we've been in the lane so much of teaching tennis teachers and teaching juniors, but really tough for entry-level adults is um, we're at the mercy of our impulses and we become slaves to our habits. So when you see someone, and for me, it's like fingernails across a blackboard when I see somebody hit the ball poorly. And it's like refund. It's like, oh, you know, the parents have paid all this hard-earned money for tennis lessons, and the kids weren't taught, you know, it sounds very promotional, but they weren't taught a great base. And um, so to, to teach people how to volley, slow down, self-evaluate, it's game-based training. It, to me, I mean, people might think I'm cynical, but it's about making money. Make it fun so the kid comes back. It needs to be um, form-based with game-based you know, so you got to be clever. Okay, we're going to, we have kids drop hit balls in the alley, rally in the alley, play a set in the alley. But then they don't really know, even though you've told them, hey, the tennis court's 19.1 degrees, down the line, cross court. So, you know, those are not very good lines. We've said that before. You're going center, you're going off center, and path the racket, path of the target. But you, you want to tell them, hey, this is why you have to do this. Um, you know, we put, when we put the five cones, how you see the court, we have the percentage post and the center mark. You're on the right side of the court, in the ball over the right side of the net, and your parents could take their car and drive it between those two cones. Yeah. And your goal in the rally, keep, keep the ball deep, um, wait for your opponent to miss, hit short, or change the direction of the ball. But, you know, people have to, you know, you know it's like you think back about taking a physics class or something chemistry class and it's like the teacher's like whoa they know so much but if you spend so much time with one subject it's pretty simple like, oh that makes sense that makes sense but um that's where a routine for us is study content we have a film of a young eight-year-old going through a very he's a very gifted athlete we do all these backflips and and uh and he didn't do it i, I learned it through gymnastics he learned it because his father liked the tv show power rangers Mm -hmm. So we have this film where we got the ball kid hitting the ball really well. And it's okay. Is he going to, we, we got him to start the course. Can he stay the course? And you know, that's the thing. Can you, can you just keep this going? And I think a lot of times people think they outgrow the basics. Okay. We worked on that with this coach. They taught us the basics. Now we can go somewhere else. You know, in the merchant of flesh, the person who's out there on the weekends handing out business cards. Um, we covered that in the podcast. Um, the, the legend in their own mind. Um, the older they get, the better they were. But we have a, a tape of this young uh, eight-year-old boy um, doing a series of all these exercises. But you have to be clever and say, no, we need to do those at home. You, don't, you can't wait till you go to the tennis court. Um, you know, I had a, uh, my brother uh, wrote a book, Dryland Training for Hockey. And it really came from his study of Russian hockey. Is, you know, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't need a hockey rink to practice hockey. You got to have imagination. Imagination is greater than knowledge. And then people are really short on time. We tell people a routine is do 10 minutes of yoga. You know, I, I was told this by a yoga master. When you get very accomplished in yoga, it'd be very good to do a different routine every day. But maybe this is how I'm so structured is don't just take one. There was a USTA put out a great tape years ago and James Blake became number four in the world. What a great story. And, um, he was the athlete, um, and I think Mark Merklin, um, really into fitness, uh, was, be, was behind this. But um, and I'm sure other people as well, but it was a fantastic routine. And we, had all, we, and it, we, we, we need to dig that back out and go back to that because when you ask kids to stretch, they, they don't really stretch. Um, but, you know, to do that over and over again. But so if you were to do 10 minutes of yoga, go, and it's just commitment. You know, how, you know, look me in the eye. How many times are you doing 10 minutes of yoga? If you say you're going to do it twice, once isn't enough. You're going to do it twice a week. Mm -hmm. 
You know, do you have a place where it's a gut check? Are you honest with yourself? Are you, are you checking it off? Are you, are you checking it off? And um, coming back, I mentioned Chad Burrell's got a lot of great lines. He said that uh, if you come and hang out with us, you need, to, you need to hang out for two years. That it's just a snapshot, you know, it, um, with, uh, you know, the, well, you know, you weren't doing this before. I go, well, you've only, you've only, you're only here for a few months. I mean, you don't really know exactly what we do. Um, you mentioned uh, transition boards and it comes to my mind. Uh, I visit a tennis program in South America just to uh, see the practice. And I talk with uh, a, the coach in charge, in charge of the, the, the practice. And um, came the conversation and said, I'm against the transition balls. First of all, he said, we don't have the budget to buy it. And second one, you can hit the ball with those transition balls wherever you want it, and still you can put the ball in. It's against uh, uh, against the kids to teach the right form to hit. You know? uh, what do you think about it? Well, we don't have any transition balls. We, we actually do. <laughs> we, we have access, but if we, somebody wants transition balls, we have to go, okay, wait a minute. We have to go back to storage. We don't have them at our fingertips um, the way we're working right now. Um, <coughs> when... Uh, Excuse me. When um, you know, it's like the wind. The wind really affects those balls. But no, you're, I agree that it's not real tennis. Um, and again, there's no science behind it. You know, why, why couldn't a kid hit a real tennis ball and just not hit it hard? And that's one beautiful thing about saving old tennis balls, dead tennis balls. You know, lots of reps. You know, for me, um, I've had so many kids where, and I've, I, I may be the best for using the worst balls. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 always, I, I always tell people, you know, we're not really operating that now that way now. Now we're taking we're, how we're doing. We have a bag, three or four bags of good balls. But I've always said the, the worse the balls, the better the program. And, you know, you're getting kids to do drop hits and tossing balls back and forth. So I've had so many kids where you remember the, that facility in, in Tampa where they would squeeze a ball and they didn't like it and they'd hit the ball over the fence. I'd say, <laughs> you are going to go get that ball. Um, but no, um, I want to mention one thing It brings back a, a flashback. Um, but I remember one time in Tampa, I said, all right, Roberto, you're going to do this for the next five days. You're going to go 10 different places. You can go this place in the morning, this place in the afternoon. And, um, you know, you were just starting out. It was not like people knew you. And this is, uh, perhaps against the USPTA PTR code of conduct. Because, you know, actually, as a visiting pro, you're supposed to introduce yourself if you're on a facility. But say you just go in and say, you know, I have some, you know, you have your two daughters and you're interested in the program and um, and just kind of hang out, you know, and watch and send you to 10 different programs uh-huh. and then come back and say, okay, we, we're doing things a little bit differently. Um, no, I think that um, they they are expensive, um, I think here during the pandemic, there's been a shortage, but, uh, you know, you know, parents will call me up and I mean, we had a girl visit um, from New Jersey and the mother brought it up that she has to transition from one ball to the next. And, you know, that's just like a, a player transitioning from clay court to hard court. You know, if you go from, yeah. if you go from clay to hard, it's a little more difficult because you want to go from hard to clay. You want to go from Fast, slow, not slow to fast. You're going to be off a little bit if you've been playing on clay for a month and then you play on a hard court. But, you know, this idea I need to transition, um, Matt Clore, um, he did a video for us. It's a great video. It's maybe seven minutes long. And, you know, he's helping a young player from England. And um, the whole point is it doesn't matter. You know, he's, he's you know teaching a kid a forehand and backhand. He's tossing them a... Uh, different different tennis balls, um, the um, but that really I don't think that should have been mandated. Where you know uh, Wayne Brandt Brian, I think people forgot about the letter he wrote to the USTA and said he really liked the ten and under program if it was for six year olds. He goes, yeah, you're all right, but you're four years too late. And um, so no, I again I think they're training tools. They're training tools. Um, but I think that um, it hasn't it hasn't worked. 
kids are still serving with palm up and yeah. you know there's a big emphasis there was millions and millions of dollars spent i mean couldn't somebody have said okay we're going to play little kid doubles and it's going to be one bounce doubles you know that should be a routine we've asked people around the country around the world if you could find 15 minutes a day to have your players play one bounce doubles and we like to do it where there's no poaching just you know okay you know just uh, get, get your serve in, get the return cross court, let the player learn to serve and volley. So you just have a couple of rules. But if the ball bounces, you lose the point. Yeah. What do you say one bounce is just the serve? Just the return. Just the return. Just the return. Yeah. 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 It reminds me of, that reminds me of a fun story with uh, Ilya Nastasi. Ilya Nastasi, go off on a tangent here. Ilya Nastasi was playing Cliff Drysdale. Cliff Drysdale used to always wear a glove. And I mean, that guy's going strong now. I mean, it's amazing. He's an old guy. So Drysdale is, he's coming in not only on Nastasi's second serve, he's coming in on Nastasi's first serve. And Nastasi was loose, so athletic. But, you know, he, he, he could have been told to toss the ball a little more to the right. Um, and so anyway, Nastasi stops. But he, he, t- he learned this from Tyriac. He could really orchestrate the crowd. And he goes, no, no, no. He's waving his finger. He had a lot to do. Mm-hmm. Tyriac taught Nastasi. Nastasi taught Connors. And, you know, he's waving his finger. And he goes, no, 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 no. You can't do that. I serve. I come in first. You have to wait for the ball to bounce. <laughs> so what he did is he started serving volley. I remember yeah. Raven Claussen playing Rajiv Ram. And uh, I said he was coming in on every second serve, Right. They played some doubles and did really well for several years together. And I said, Klassen, um, you're a little more athletic than Rom. Physically, Rom, I mean, I think the guy, <laughs> I, 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 th- I, th- I think that Rom, you know, he's, he, give him the vote of being a genius mentally. I mean, Mike Costa, Rom yawns in between volleys. That, uh, I, you know, so, he, you know, he played him and, you know, he's pretty successful against him after that in singles. You know, this is when they were both ranked probably in the 200s. And I said, no, that guy's coming in on your second serve. Say, no, no, no. Hit it to the body so it's, then he, doesn't, he can't move it around. He's gotta, he doesn't have the angle. And just come in against him. You know, that's Braden's favorite drill is line two people up on the baseline. You know, that's a routine. I mean, again, I like to focus on routines at home. But you, we just call it rat-a-tat-tat. You feed the ball and you come in at each other. Boom, 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 boom. So you're, you're not afraid of the ball. Um, I mean, I watch four players today. You know, they all have strokes to, you know, a decent level of respect. Every one of them ran around their backhand volley to play a forehand volley. And you just come over and go, guys, the speed of the game's going to change, and it ain't going to work. Like my English, it ain't going to work. <laughs> with, um, what's your favorite routine that we share, share with kids? Um... I'm uh, I'm concerned about um, players can no volley and um, players are no using um, the underspin or slice they call a run or all enough, you know. Say it again, last part. Um, that the game is uh, moving in, in direction that we feel we, we loosen the finesse, the art, the touch, and um, we don't see players uh, 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 um, using the underspin or slice. So um, I uh, I encourage the players to you know uh, starting a mini tennis, um, a, a underspin to underspin. Uh, go to the wall and do the uh, underspin, uh, top spin, underspin, uh, uh, tabletop. Um, uh, w- what are your thoughts about uh, the underspin? Um, uh, uh, I remember Big Brain used to say it, it, it requires a lot of skills. It's a tough shot. Rod Laver, Lane Wimbledon, he would top spin on your pro shots in the beginning. You know, and Vic, we talk about the variance. Um, you have to be so on the money, so accurate with underspin. The variables, page 36, tennis for the future. Um, the angle of the racket face, angle of the racket pass, speed of the racket, and the speed and the trajectory of the incoming ball. I mean, with Braden, 
yeah, I did this and that for Vic. Um, you know, worked with him in California, traveled, did all these things, working as a consultant for his tennis schools in Europe. But I had students reading his books, and you know, there's so many times where okay, read this chapter, and you know, the students haven't read the chapter, and and uh, it's a it's a Bible of tennis. I mean, it's just fact based. So, um, I think with volleys to begin with, and something I repeat, I would say weekly. Martina Naratilova, she won nine Wimbledon titles. I think she should have won ten. You know, I'm sure she would say, I this final, that final, I could have won more. She had a great underspin backhand approach shot. And the ten, tennis groups is hard pressed. They're hard pressed to name ten players. Excuse me, go nine, nine Wimbledon titles. Name nine players who've won, who can hit. Have been able to hit an underspin backhand. Graf would be one. Novotna. I mean, they could hit the shot. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think one thing is art appreciation, history appreciation. Uh, someone sent me a podcast that listened to Stan Fawcett, who's now coaching Victor Little. I said, okay, I listened to it. And Stan goes, I'm just amazed that this kid understands so much about history. I was with him at a USTA clinic, and Brian Godfrey was there. Godfrey got to the French Open final, and Victor not only you know, got a chance to hit balls with him, you know, nobody else, knew, none of the young kids even knew who he was. And uh, Godfrey said, he's uh, such a quiet guy. Arthur Ashe said about Godfrey, uh, he practiced on a day he was married. Uh, the hardest working player ever. And um, Godfrey goes, yeah, it was great to have him know who I was, but I really didn't like the fact that he knew what the score was when he played Vilas in the French Open final. And I said, well, you could ask him again, but the reason, the reason that he was in the French Open final is Borg played world team tennis that year. So um, the uh, appreciation to understand the game. I do think that's one of the reasons that French players, um, you know, over the whole, the French players are, you know, have better looking technique. And um, but I think they have an appreciation for the art of tennis. Yeah. Um, you know, I talked to Dave Secker the other day, and he was watching a girl that we have taught to play, and she could hit volleys well over as well, and she went to a tournament, and she's anxiety back of the brain and she's not coming in and um you gotta just love to volley but also to you you know kids they big brain this is for everybody this is a big myth all the way through every level of tennis you know people don't be intimidated by somebody if they're a federation coach or they're coaching somebody who's on the tour or you're at a grand slam it's a brain drain at every level to me it's very much the same i think people are doing better with nutrition and fitness but to me every circle of tennis the the knowledge base is very similar. But with uh, the brain drain, that when you go to the net, you have 130 degrees volume potential. You got to be right on the money on the baseline to hit a passing shot. Of course, kids today can't really hit a passing shot. They don't understand a two shot passing shot because they're not used to counterattacking. And, um, and then the stats. So you go through the you go through the geometry, then the stats, two out of three turns into four out of six, eight out of twelve. People listen to these podcasts, so put all the they should be putting the building blocks together. Carlos Goffey, Bill Jacobson, um, that all through all of tennis. You know, Roger Federer, good things happen when you go to that. Roger Federer, it's frightening how low the level of play is at Wimbledon. I know that less than two percent of the time my opponents are coming in behind their serve. And that's an amazing thing that, you know, the kids that's not true in this sport that I love. I mean, you can talk about soccer. I mean, um, I would consider myself a student of tennis. With hockey, now everybody can skate. That wasn't the case years ago. Everybody can fly. And the sport's really gotten better. But there's people making millions of dollars that, you know, one, they don't play doubles. That's part of it, too. But they, they can't volley. Um, you know, I think they could look at the equipment. Um, I do think that, and it's not what they're doing when they're pros. The reason people don't go to the net is brain memory. They don't go to the net when they're a little kid. Yeah. You know, some kid, you know, they start playing high school tennis as a freshman, and they're going to play. They play one up, one back because they want to win. You know, they want to play number one doubles versus number two, and it's just sad. You know, you learn by making mistakes. Make the right mistake. And you know, we do things where if you go up to the net. Um, you know, Richard Hernandez loves to do this drill. You, you're a plus three at the net and a minus one. 
So if you win the point at the net, you'll keep your own score. You, 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 you play five serves, I'll play five serves, we'll play 10 points, simple math. And, and then we start again. It has nothing to do with who's winning. It's just keep your own score. So you end up as a, with a plus or a minus. So when you go to the net, you're a, you win on a volley, it's a plus three. You win on over, it's a plus three. You're up there and you miss, it's a minus one. But on the baseline, you flip it. If you're at the baseline um, you're, and you launch, Chris Clore, you launch a missile down the line, you launch a missile cross court, you get a plus one. But if you miss it, you get a minus three. And then you get, come on in and it, it takes them a long time to get to a positive. Uh, but, you know, a routine to define that is something you do over and over and over again. And, you know, really good coaches do boring drills because boring drills are doing the same thing day in and day out. And it's like, no, we have to do this drill. And, you know, the great athletes, um, I always say Tom Brady, his father taught him in elementary school. This is how you take a snap. This is how you do crossovers. And why we mention that, that's how you go back for an overhead. That's how you go back for an overhead. And um, even if it's like it's a really good lob, you don't have your left hand on the on the – racket or you're in football you just turn and pump your arms if it's super you just turn and go back and then you quickly turn around you, you know with a lob you find the ball bouncing um but there is no secret sauce there is no secret sauce and people think okay yeah, this is expensive i need something extra and um you know really in the end most people in tennis they didn't really have a good beginning they don't, and, you know, I mean, uh, Mark Kovacs, obviously, is a leader in tennis, highly educated guy, Aussie, so well-liked, won an NCAA doubles title. And, you know, he puts out all sorts of content, and it's like, it's oh, look at Sloane Stevens or look at um, the girl from Chicago. Uh, she's been top 10 in the world. Should just be able to rattle her name off. Um, you know, spent a lot of years in Boca at Everett's. But she has, they both, has a huge, they both have huge backswings. And, and he's, he's not wrong. Say, you can play with a big backswing. But then to speculate. But no, all, from where we're coming from, I don't think, I hope people aren't thinking that, you know, oh, okay, um, they, this pro, we're saying this pro has to change their game. You know, we are hearing things like Manny Diaz was on the podcast and said that uh, John Isner would have had millions more if he was taught the backhand volley by Welby Van Horn. Yeah. And... Um, great guy, and he's had such a great career. But to speculate, like, what if, you know, that, uh, and that's a very dangerous thing to, to copy the pros. You know, I mean, I grew up playing ice hockey. You could copy how Wayne Gretzky tucked in his jersey or how Bobby Orr, you know, you get to the point where he didn't use tape at all, but you just have one strand of tape. Well, I tape my stick like Bobby Orr. And um, it was like, okay, uh, but. With, uh, you know, was I looking at how he could, you know, turn on a dime and, you know, what he, I mean, that guy could just flat out skate. Yeah. I think you used to say that use the, the pros for inspiration. Uh, how, is, how is that, Steve? Yeah, if you go to a concert, you know, you want to learn to play the saxophone, you go to the concert for inspiration. Yeah. You go to the person who teaches the saxophone for information. That's you know, if someone's going to be a dental dentist and then they're training a dental hygienist, uh, this program that we started for tennis teachers, you know, why do I have that on the tip of my tongue is that Eugene Allen was a dentist. Eugene Allen loved tennis. Eugene Allen started a program for dental hygienists. So, I mean, I'm 26 years old. He's the president of the board of trustees. I hit balls with him. He's a great guy. But I hit balls with him. Okay, you know, people ask you how good you are when you're tw in your 20s playing tennis and so I played with this fine gentleman like every Tuesday night. And, and uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, you, the way a, a dentist, um, if they are positioning their elbow or something around, there's, there's, there's dentists who've had to stop practicing because for years and years they had their, their hands, their arms, their limbs in inefficient positions. So, um, yeah, I think just, again, what are you striving for? Are you striving for people to be efficient? Um, but... Um, you know, that's where you have to understand a kid. You know, they're going to be, they're going to be inspired. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but kids love Nick, uh, Nick Kyrgios. He's actually great with kids. He has a foundation for kids. And, but, um, 
you know, I think they'd be better off to find their own way how they conduct themselves on the court, but they'd be much better off to copy copy his toss on his serve than his mood swings. Oh yeah. And you know, but you know, so then what does the kid Great see? That, that expression is uh, children. Um, they close their ears to advice and open their eyes to example. And you know, it's, it is it is very very powerful um, to have players learn how to, like, you know, really speak tennis. Uh, you know, too many times what players will do at like corporate outings is they just tell war stories and they're fun, but um, they really should be able to to emphasize. Years ago, the ATP, um, to my knowledge, the WTA, WTA did not do that years ago, but I, I was fortunate enough to just be, to sit in on some classes. But they had a school. Now they make so much money, they don't do it. But years they, they do have a school, but it's more on what to do with your money. Years ago, the school for the ATP pros was, what are you going to do after your pro career? Because you're not going to make enough money. Um, and it was how to enter the tennis teaching profession, how, how to enter the tennis industry. And it's very, very sad, um, getting away from routines, but uh, someone who has a very good playing background, and they, they get the big jobs. They get the big jobs. Um, the pedigree. Um, you know, you can look at any federation, and for the most part, they're hiring people who played. Um, you know, you and I are latecomers to the game, and I think it's a positive, of course, you know, or say, oh, that's bias, that's just the way you think, is uh, to come from a different sport and have to learn it. Um, you know, the Soviet system years ago, there's, you, you needed to be a master of two sports anyway. And then you find out uh, that sport's the same. Yeah. It's all based on a principle. It should be just like life, you know. It's, it's, it's the, the human element. I mean, I, I way out of line talking about religion, but um, the um, it's just... You know what's right. What, what what makes sense? Is the principle in place? Is, it, is this good for? Is this good for the human being, the fellow human being? You mentioned uh, go to the teacher. Um, you are one of the best teachers in in the world. I'm gonna go to you. If you you uh, are gonna say um, to many players, young kids and tournament kids, they are thinking how I can improve my game. Uh, what do you think are the benefits of uh, hitting underspin or slice? Well, I mean, one, defense. Uh, you got to be able to dig a ball out of the corner. Murray's pretty good at absorbing pace. Um, you have to have options. Vic Braden, I was at the East Bowl with him one time, and we're walking around, and he goes, well, if you're playing someone who's better than you from the baseline, you just might as well mail him the score because it's already over. You have no options. You know, you watch watch kids play. Um, Raleigh Smith, if he's listening, he was so competitive. He just couldn't teach the guy. Good player. He played at Northwestern. Just couldn't teach him. He's so ultra competitive. So he ended up on my doorstep several times as a junior. And, um, I mean, I tried teaching him to play left-handed. And he was psycho competitive left-handed. And um, the... Uh, but no, I think let's go play a set. You serve underhand to the kids, one your opponent's one hand and backhand, and that's how the set starts. You have to play creative tennis. You have to have creative sets. And then again, you know, um, I hope we're providing value for our listeners with, uh, I mean, we do have like, okay, here's 50 routines that you're not doing. Like, do you, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Taking your notes, rewriting your notes. But... Um, yeah, and unfortunately, you have to force kids to play that way. And then there are so many factors. I mean, it's not right that a fifth year, a fifth grader knows what their tennis recruiting dot net level is. A fifth grader knows what their UTR is, yeah. and they go out and they have fear of losing. You know, and they know their UTR is going to be higher if they can drum the kid. You know, tennis players years ago go, "I'm going to win this set." And they can experiment. They go, "I can experiment." And, you know, okay, I'm certain volley. You know, I lost the first set. And coaches would even do that. Certain volley first set. Then you, you, you dig, you're set in the hole, then dig it out. And um, no, so, um, you know, I think actually to challenge a kid, I, I know you love to have kids at tabletop. But a great, great thing about tabletop is framework. You know, I see you get them on the backboard and you have them do tabletops. You know, from that framework, you can play a side spin approach out. 
you know, Kramer's famous side, side spin approach on the forehand side, Connors. And people, again, they have to appreciate Jack Kramer or Jimmy Connors and how good they were. And, you know, then the, the, how, you know, side spin will hit and, and how it slides off to the side of the court. And, it, you know, the expression, it's a very heavy ball with, um, you can take tabletop and play modified topspin. You know, you're, you're, you know, someone's hitting a, a kick forehand. You know, they really is that. It's like a weak serve. It's coming high, but it's, it's not penetrating the court. You just come in and it's a bounce hit rhythm, like a shortstop in baseball. Um, with, uh, but, it, you know, I, I do this with kids who come in and they have a really extreme grips. Um, you know, a lot of kids, not only a Western grip on the forehand, but their op hand on their two hand is too far underneath. And as a result, they have to bring the, out, the racket outside in. It can be done. Jim Courier is pretty good. It can be done, but um, you say, okay, we want you to play a set of tennis. The only only shot you can hit topspin on is your serve, and they, they can't do it. You know, you can do sets where, okay, three ground strokes, and you got to come in. You know, then the second set is four ground strokes. And use the uh, slice wonder spin as attack. Yeah, I mean, you, you can... Um, um, you can have people where they have to play John Newcomb. It came from Clarence Mabry. You're going to play a set of tennis. You're inside the baseline. You can't play topspin. But you can't go behind the baseline. And, 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 you know, the thing about when you play flat, you have to swing up. You know, the, when the ball hits the court, the court has more spin. Uh, the court puts more spin on the ball than the player. So you have to swing up on a flat shot. And, you know, then you'll hear people like Bozo the Clown go, people don't play it that way anymore. And you can say, yeah, that's exactly why we're doing it. I mean, there's all these lost arts. Um, with, um, you know, we do see people play too many slice forehands. That they're not even outside the single sideline and they play a slice forehand. Uh, but you have to be able to hit every shot. You know, you can actually take people and you don't want to have a continental grip. Years ago, that was a, a negative of, old school tennis is even Welby Van Horn was a genius. You know, that was a mistake that Welby made. And, you know, I was in the nursing home, extended care. Um, and he's in his nineties and he's still studying tennis. And he goes, I was wrong. I mean, his system for teaching beginners to me is still the best, but he's, if he was teaching people in the era of where, well, you're going to be great. His best student was, uh, Charlie Passarell and you're going to play on grass sometimes with spikes because they don't pull the tarp over when it rains, wooden rackets, and you don't want the ball to bounce. So he changed it. You know, it was a composite grip, but he called it the championship grip. Of course, kids wanted to do that. Um, they wanted to do what the pros were doing. So, but you can take a kid's grip and tape it to a continental and even play mini tennis, but play a set. And, um, you know, that's where you, you opened up by these kids Kids in soccer, they play, play, play. Um, we do the mini tennis five where you, instead of hitting it twice, which is a great drill, you can hit that twice and say, you know, on the forehand, hit the reverse follow through. On the, on the backhand, you have to hit underspin. Mm -hmm. But then they're hitting it. But then the, there's the other thing, too, is that are they going to hit it in a match? So that's where you have to overload it in practice. But the kids are going to go with their strength. You know, and that's a really, a, you, you have Nick Balteri. You know, you have, you know, he used to say that, you know, he started becoming, you know, he was teaching resort tennis in the 70s and the 80s. You know, he put himself where he was recruiting people and he was all of a sudden the junior guru. Paul Anacone was somebody who went to his facility and, you know, and was allowed to play the way he was playing. But everything was forehand, forehand, forehand. And, you know, Linda Courier with uh, Jim, she said, fix his backhand. And she, he said, don't worry about his backhand, forehand, forehand, forehand. And Nick is so open about things. Um, but um, no, it, you know, the underspin backhand, keeping the ball low. But you ask kids why. You know, kids are always, you know, always, I say always and never too much. But um, it's almost always when you ask them, do you ever approach cross court? They go, no, 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 no. Fun story for me about going cross court. Uh, we can wrap this thing up here a bit. I was... Um, at Illinois to do a function where I was working with the tennis teams. So the women's coach and the men's coach are um, students of mine, Jennifer Roberts, Craig Tiley. And two guys, big guys, handsome guys, little ego, uh, the names, uh, 
Nathan Zeter and Mike Costa. So it changed over time. The NCAA rules how they pay, how they paid me, but at that time, uh, the coach couldn't be there. The rules had changed. I come in as a consultant, and I could meet with a coach without the players there. So, um, you know, I've been doing this for 48 years, a long time. So, I go in and I'm working with two girls, and I'm having them work on a, a backhand, an underspin backhand. Hey, it's a green light point. Bill Jacobson, you're up by two or three points. Player hits short. Um, you know, you've got a player on the other side. You got to reset backhand. Even know what that means. Play the approach shot and come in. And so Zeter and uh, um, Costa started laughing at me. And they, they're laughing at me. There he goes. I go, what are you guys laughing at? And he goes, you're supposed to approach cross. You're supposed to approach down the line. I go, really? I said, well, by Monday, you guys will understand. You need to approach cross court. And, you know, Tylee is such a hardworking guy, smart guy, and did so many great things for us. He started as a student and contributed so much. But, you know, I'm the one who has spent all the time with someone like Braden. And uh, that summer, George Bastel, I made a video for a guy named George Bastel from Switzerland for Tylee. And Bastel beat Sampras at Wimbledon. Just for the listeners, Tyler is now in charge of the Australian. Uh, yeah, he's the CEO, bright, bright yeah. guy. I mean, he's so organized. Parented so well. Positive, positive, positive. He's my son's godfather. So po uh, Posey, that's going to be our 100th podcast. Posey, Tyler, they rhyme. So um, time after time, you go back, it's on YouTube, if you watch that, is um, Bastel was coming in on the backhand approach to San Francisco's backhand. Um, with uh, Brad Gilbert comes to my mind where he's coaching um, he's coaching Roddick and I think it was the first round so the next year we lost to Rosetsky I think somebody we do have a fact finder out there so the second year he's playing Rosetsky but it's in the second round everybody knows you play a lot better in the second round than you do in the first round but Gilbert had him said hey hit your serve and come in on the second ball but at least, you know, even in doubles, you know, uh, Dave Secker said that, you know, with our podcast with him and his team, you know, the, t the two coaches, the two Englishmen, Simon and Dave, they've done a great job turning that program around. But so I, you're going to go to the net. Maybe you're not going to go to the net where you serve and volley. If you're taking, you're starting to work with a girl who's 18 years old and she's been playing since she was six and she doesn't volley on the first ball. You know, Nancy Ritchie and Billie Jean King. Uh, Billie Jean King, 20 Wimbledon titles, she played with Richie and said, okay, we'll both stay back and come in together. And they won the Virginia Slims. Um, you know, a little way, a little bit from routines, but um, I think if you were to interview, um, you know, a, a Michael Jordan, you know, what routines? A lot of times they don't have the memory, like what did, what did coaches make you do when you were really young? Yeah. Uh, we, we li we, I was with a group of athletes at this junior college that you and I worked at. And there was an old man that came in to speak, and I thought it was fantastic. So it's a banquet, and he spoke for like an hour and a half. And I, I thought that it was the greatest thing. He was an assistant coach for Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan. And there's a, it was a balance. We have one here in storage. We have a balance beam, you know, a cylinder. So it's like, on, it's like it's on a wheel, and it's not a skateboard, it's not a surfboard, but it's in between, and you have to balance yourself. And they, the basketball coaches use it for defense. And Michael Jordan couldn't do it. And the players started laughing at him. And the, the coach told a story. He said that Jordan was an animal. It took him, it, it, it didn't take him very long, but he was so persistent. You know, he came in, you know, hours before practice started and he stayed afterwards. And he became like the best on that balance, on that balance board. And so, you know, he made that a routine. Okay, you can't do this. And then you just yeah. tackle it. Um, I'll try this from memory. So he said that this guy was saying that he coached a basketball team and he was coaching the, uh, he had seven, uh, seven S's. So he was coaching slow. Well, that, I haven't said this in a while. He was coaching sloppy. He was coaching spastic. Uh, slow, sloppy, spastic. There's two more. 
I have, to have this by memory. So then this punchline, slow, sloppy, spastic. Um, S-H-I-T-T-T-Y wasn't one of them. But um, so then he says, he, he was coaching, oh, short was one of them. Short was one. I'll get the fifth one. Slow, sloppy, spastic, short. And the fifth one, and then he paused like any good comedian. He said, and on the bench, I had sick and sorry. <laughs> and, you know, but what was great about that speech is, you know, he's coaching. He's a coach in the NBA, the world championship champion, Chicago Bulls. And he's talking to the kids about fundamentals and basics. And anyway, I coached this one tennis, one basketball team, and this who's on my team. And, um, you know, Braden, you know, you take the ice cream cone and you put it in the middle of your forehead. It's going to take you a little time to teach that kid. The kid goes, the kid goes to the water fountain, and they can't make the water hit their hit their lips. You can teach that kid, but it's going to take a little bit longer. So what you want to do, Bradenism, is you take the drill. The, the routine, the task, the assignment, and you scale it down. Well, you also, you can look at it on the other side. I'm working with little kids. i got to scale it up. You know, Braden would take a, a class, and the first thing he'd do to teach the forehand, I mean, he would teach the dimensions of the court, and he'd have kids come up, adults, mostly adults, actually. Um, he got out of junior tennis. He was seven years at the Kramer Club, and, you know, I would think the people working at the Kramer Club right now would be going, okay, what happened here when, when Uncle Vic was running this place? How were they teaching tennis when Vic was here? And, you know, Tracy's there. It's, he's a member. And it's going, you know, it, would it be accepted to go back and go, well, let's do what Fat Albert was doing back then? But um, so he got into teaching adults because he wanted to raise more money for research, you know, you know, his own money to find out more about the game. So he would just, he brings players up. They just, they don't have a racket. They just drop their hand. They drop the ball and they hit the hit the ball with their hand. Um, you know, say okay, that's pretty good. And you say okay, I'm going to make that a routine. I'm going to go to the garage. I tell parents, go to a toy store, buy a basketball hoop, buy some foam balls, and then you know that's where the years ago the the dad in America wanted his you know kid to be able to throw baseball. They would go to the pond and and they would throw rocks. You know, how far can you throw the rock, or can you can you throw the rock? know to this target um but um you know then Braden would just you know right away be teaching that's how he had a forehand you know palm guidance i mean people like vic Braden, dennis vandermeer welby van horn they must be rolling over in their graves the way the forehand's taught today but uh let's wind it down here routines we uh didn't get to 50. let's uh you mentioned uh brad gilbert uh talking about routines he had an interview for uh Spanish listeners, and um, he said uh, he's still, that's a good, uh, actually good for the kids, good for everybody, for competitive players. He still had three times a week, every, every morning around 6 a.m., mm -hmm. he goes to the wall and has his routines. That's good. I love, to listen, good. I love to listen to Gilbert. Uh, Gilbert, for our teachers of technique, though, um, Gilbert, was asked about grips, and he said, I don't do grips. And, you know, actually, when you're helping someone out, you can work with their game up to a certain point and then with their game. If someone comes to us and they go, okay, you're top 10 in the country, American kid, for example, you're top 10 in the country, and you're going to be recruited. Um, you're going to go to a Power 5 conference. You're getting a full scholarship. But that's not usually the case. Usually the case is they're not top 100, and no one from one of those big-time schools is going to even, you know, how's it go? Pro tennis, they'll find you. College tennis, same thing. College tennis finds you. You don't find college tennis. And, um, no, it's very, very difficult to make changes. And, I mean, I, I would think, for the most part, a grip change is more difficult than a swing change. But it's how the information is presented. Is the information solid? Is it truthful? Based on science, based on logic. And then how it's presented. And I think one of the biggest things is people are in a hurry to go nowhere fast. Junior tennis. They're going backwards. And say, no, no, if you do it the right way, if you go about it the right way. Um, you know, I got into tennis late and certainly didn't become a great player. 
uh, back in the 70s when lots of people were playing, I could say, oh, I was top 20 in Florida. I would say that there was 20 people at the Miami airport any day that could beat me. Because so many people are not playing. They were really good, and then they're not playing anymore. But, um, you know, it just was taught the right – I mean, I was taught such bad information. And I remember that because I was 19. And um, – but in the end, Scotty Perelman used to say this. Um, you know, he, would, he hired many of the people I trained. He came and made presentations. He had a huge tennis camp. He's a coach at Florida. He was on our podcast. And he would say to our students – yeah, you've got the information, but what are you going to do with it? And you have to grow it. You know, it's, it's just, you know, it's, um, you have to just work it and work it. I mean, um, if someone is a cat carpenter, they're going to start taking out the old, you know, they have a demo, they demolish the old kitchen, and they're going to be, you know, taking it out, you know, piling it up, breaking it down, taking the old nails out for safety, whatever. And they're going to be sweeping sawdust. And they're just going to hang around. They're just going to watch. And they're going to do that. If they do that long enough, they become a master carpenter. You know, can they pound a nail straight? But the tennis doesn't work that way. Um, I mentioned about Dave Anderson. He's had so many people work for him. Uh, I just know this is a case over and over again. Uh, Richard Arenas and I were talking, training a young guy who was a very, very good player. He was number two in the NCAAs. And, you know, he went down the road where you could make $5 more an hour. And it's like, no, you need to hang around and you need to master your craft. But, you know, that's where tennis teachers, the young tennis teachers, they make too much money too soon. Um, they make too much money. Yeah. And, you know, they go someplace and it's like, well, this is what you'll get paid if you work in the junior clinic. But, you know, if you have your own, you know, that's program hours. But then if you have self-generated hours, you get paid more money. And, of course, they want to get paid more money and they want to give lessons. They want to give privates. But, um, no, I think three years is a good number, you know, for people to work as a volunteer. You know, take the role of starving artist and you, you work nights, so you, then you, 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 put, you put, your, put yourself around someone who can teach tennis and teach tennis well. Um, but, you know, when we get up in the morning, anybody, you get up in the morning, you turn the light on. You know, maybe, okay, I you turn the alarm off, you turn the light on, and you have all these, you have, like, you know, so many little jobs you have to do, you know, everything from, you know, the shower to the, to, you know, just basic stuff before you leave the door. And that all becomes a routine. Okay. And okay. Yeah. I do take a shower. Yeah. I do brush my teeth and yeah, I don't wear the same clothes every day. And, but people don't think that way when it comes down to getting better at a sport, it just becomes a routine. And this is a must. I think a good thing to end on is, Shadow swinging is like brushing your teeth. But, you know, you know, we all, you know, could spend more time with a, a dental hygienist and, you know, this is how you clean your teeth and clean your teeth well because there's just different levels to doing that. But with um, when kids are um, shadow swinging, they're not switched on. You know, we're, we're transitioning. I know you're excellent at transitioning. You know, we have a group of kids and you're going to change – you know, you're going to change, you know, one kid comes in late or another two kids come in. It's no problem. Just change practice. Group dynamics is that we have, we have no problem with group dynamics. We don't do groups. And, um, but you tell a kid, okay, go do, just go touch the middle of the net. I don't like kids to slap the top of the net. The net's made of plastic. You know, most people are not buying the nets that are teaching. And the director is the operator. She get out there and say, touch the middle of the net. Go back, do crossovers and shadow swinging overhead. It's like sheep going through a gate. They're not doing it with purpose. They're not doing it like, you know, Matt Clare says that. Do it like there's a ball there. You know, I love to watch and listen to people teach tennis. Yeah. And, you know, I'm fortunate to be around a lot of tennis, tennis teachers the way we have people visit all the time. But we say, okay, go do the tiebreaker test. We, we do that. We test people from the beginning. Go do the six-ball drill. Shadow swing the six-ball drill. And they're not doing it, where they're moving their feet, they're shadow swinging. Um, I'll shut up after this, but one time I did, hosted a clinic at our place with Jim Lair. And Jim, was, you know, he's, that's not his deal. He's not a technician. He's not a biomechanist. He doesn't do, you know, I mean, obviously he does to a high level, but that's not his forte, forehands and backhands. Um, and he'll tell you that. And I think that's one of the reasons that he was so good, or is so good. So he did this thing with the Tyler Junior College tennis team. 
And it was a year, I mean, they won so many years, but it was a year that they won the national championship. And it was just the girls. I raised money for the girls to attend, raised money for the boys to attend, but it was optional. Only one boy went, Scott Stewart. I filmed and, uh, I mean, it's just crazy things, you know. So, you know, we raise money, the team gets to go for free, which wasn't really fair. And um, the players didn't go. The players didn't go. So, but what Lair did was just spot on. It was amazing. He, um, I just remember we had this set of bleachers in this small bar that players could sit on. And he had the players sit down, and he knew their level of play. He said, okay, I'm going to call the lineup. And I was running the team on an interim basis at that time. He goes, I'm going to choose who I think the number one player is, choose who the number two player is. And, um, and Scott Stewart, who went on and played at the University of Texas, great competitor, great fighter. And if somebody had taught him how to hit a tennis ball when he was younger, it would have, he would have been unbelievable. But, you know, and Lair knew his level of play. I mean, I should say he knew his style of play. He was the only, only player there from the men's team. But he knew that he was an offensive baseliner. He knew that he, he, he didn't play great tennis from the service line in just by watching people how they go through the drill. So we tell people routine is static balance in front of the mirror and then in your driveway at your house. Um, live in an apartment, it's going to be a parking lot. But you do a dynamic balance. You're doing a routine and you're doing it with a ball. Oh, excuse me, you're doing it without a ball. Stevie Nash great Canadian basketball player, people um, like Steph Curry, is he going to be able to play in college? <laughs> is he going to be able to play in the pros? It was the same thing with Stevie Nash and both MVPs. Stevie Nash, 30 minutes of basketball every day without a ball. That's a routine. Yeah. And it, it's all out there if people wanted to study sport. And it just transcends. Every sport's the same. Every sport's the same. But tennis players especially, because it is so, so tough technically, is... They need to do routines. Roberto Calla, podcast number 93, Dougie Gilmore. You shouldn't cut your hair, Roberto, but it'll grow back. Unlike, <laughs> unlike me, your hair will grow back. A distinguished gentleman with the gray hair. Anything else, Roberto? Uh, just for our listeners, uh, I was uh, concerned that uh, to have routines, uh, more specific about what is the weakness, serves, underspin, valleys. I know they want to hit forehands and backhands, but uh, my concern with the listeners and the young players and every player that's playing competitive is have a routine for underspin and volleys, and of course for the serve. When we had Warren Pretorius on, he said something that uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy says, where your backhand's a shield and your forehand's a spear. And I made the mistake of going, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, 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 no. You want them both to be a spear. Well, you, you need to have defense, but no, I think you can take it even a step further. The people really aren't trying to do that much with their backhand. But the backhands are pretty reliable because they hit two-handed, and you know, so many people, they have no idea what they're doing, a right hand or what they're doing with their left arm on the forehand. It's just flying everywhere. But um, yeah, I think making a pie graph, and you do have to spend more time working on your weaknesses. You have to work on your strengths. Uh, and you have to be creative, but you have to do the routines. And, um, you know, if people were to just take 15 minutes a day, they got to find a backboard. You know, we have, we have put together from the tennis mate, uh, you know, Andrew Garcia's, and now there's like seven versions, which is great. But labor of love, we put together a portable backboard. And you can hit 40 balls in a minute. And it's like a, it's like a stationary bicycle. The thing about stationary bicycles, people keep it in the bedroom and then it becomes a clothes rack. And the stationary backboard that we put together, people just don't use it. But if you were to use it five minutes a day, you're hitting 200 balls. And it forces you to swing um, efficiently. So, yeah, you got to uh, embrace the boredom and do the things over and over again. But 15 minutes against the backboard, draw a square, take a piece of chalk. Uh, you take the special tape they have and just over and over again, and can you put the ball in that square? Um, with um, Larry Bird, I mean, there's so many things that you can study. Larry Bird was so good that he told his teammates he was going to play left-handed for the entire half in an NBA game, and he did really well. And, um, you know, that's another routine is have kids play with their opposite hand. 
and it's just like, well, this game is tough. And then they start, they have to start the process. Um, you know, you spent a lot of years helping me and my son, Connor. Um, most kids play better tennis tactically with their opposite hand because they're not trying to be offensive from the baseline. They're trying to keep the ball deep yeah. and they, they get a, just a sniff of going forward. They, they just zoom in, they get, they get their nose over the net because they, they, they have to try to win without strokes, win without strokes. But, um, no, I'm glad and thanks for emphasizing, um, the serve, uh, volleys and underspin. I think also the return serve. It was a routine for Monica Selish. Her dad served 500 balls. One of those baskets on wheels is about 250 balls. Yeah. It's for us, it's 300 because we use such dead balls. But, <laughs> but you know, he, he stayed right at the service line. And, you know, you, you don't, if you do that really well, we, don't, we, we let the people work on their serve. We say go right at their body, right at their body. Uh, but, you know, he just thought the dad or, the, you know, is going to, any coach who knows how to do it, well, you just put the racket right here and just go, 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 go. And, and they play the return. You know, it's not a matter of getting the ball in the box. Just serve right at him. And um, so I guess we could end with that. John Wooden, the late John Wooden, the fundamental doesn't change. The speed at which you have to execute the fundamental changes. That's great. So you have to know the fundamental. So then you have to be clever and say, okay, let's do this a little bit faster. Uh, you know, Braden with a rapid feed, you know, you take four balls and go boom, 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 boom. Or they're just coming to hit a forehand ball, you take three balls and you just go boom, boom, boom. People ask me, what's your job, Steve? I, I fight ignorance every day. I've had so many people say, oh, you can't feed that way because you don't look like a pro. And it's like, shut up, are you, are you kidding me? And um, with, uh, you know, it's like a Pete Sampras. You know, people still need to go back and watch Pete volley. And, you know, what does Roger Federer say? I mean, you know, Roger Federer would be the person to say, yeah, yeah, Pete, uh, a little better on the serve and a little better on the, on the volley. And then, you know, Roger certainly, uh, you know, had, had his strength that he would have been a little better in certain categories of the game, uh, different aspects. But anyway, Roberto, I hope we shared some things with our listeners that uh, was a positive. And again, uh, we have people that listen to our podcast. Tell me, like someone told me just today, they've listened to every one. And uh, I do think that if you listen to the podcast, you know, the first one, the second one, and I know some people what happened though is they didn't start in the beginning. They didn't start in the beginning. We have one uh, fan of tennis, student of tennis, is they're working it from both ends. So now they're going to do two week and they'll eventually catch up. But the way we do these things is that uh, just look to, over the course of a week, if you listen 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Thanks. So anyway, Joe Rogan. Roberto Calla, the new Joe Rogan. <laughs> All right, adios amigos. Thanks for listening.